We've come to our fifth week in Lent and the fifth in our series of messages taken from our small group study, It Is Finished. By the way, even though it's the fifth week out of six, it's still not too late to get in a small group. <laughs> There's always room. Remember, at the very last moment, that penitent thief was given salvation. It's still, there's still an opportunity for you if you're not in a small group. We began the series by reflecting on Jesus' words of forgiveness extended to his detractors and torturers. Remember from the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Then he spoke words of hope to another who was suffering with him, offering that man a place and Jesus' own glorious future when he said to that penitent thief, today you'll be in paradise with me. We also heard how from the cross, even there on the cross, Jesus continued to focus his love for others and his duty to care for his mother when he said to the disciple, John, here is your mother. Mother, here's your son. And we reflected there on how his blood shed on the cross can actually bind believers together in his family. And last week, Daryl helped us understand Jesus' words of despair when he uttered from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And because he took on all the sin and brokenness of humanity, he felt the crushing burden of sin's end result, which is total distance from God, the source of life, and a sense of being absolutely lost and out of God's grace. That's what he took on. Today, we're going to focus on the only words he spoke that dealt with his personal, physical suffering. Hanging there, he cried out, I thirst, bringing to mind, of course, words from the Psalms, Psalm 22, my, stung, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And Psalm 69, they gave me vinegar for my thirst. By the way, I've been listening to some podcasts of a psychology professor in Toronto, Canada. And he speaks of the Bible as the first hyperlinked document in human history. <laughs> Hyperlink. You know, those. you click on this and it takes you to another website or you click on this, take it. The Bible, you, 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 there's all kinds of connections throughout it all. So, sorry, that's a, an aside. So, you, so you. What happened? To, there we go. His cry of pain is so human. And that is precisely the point. We must remember what he had endured in the previous 12 hours before his death to really appreciate his words and how difficult it must have been for him to even say them. Arrested in the middle of the night, he was slapped and punched, pushed and mocked. He was crowned with thorns that were pressed down into his scalp. He was whipped with a cat of nine tails, which is a whip that has sharp pieces of bone and stone and metal intertwined in it. His back was shredded, perhaps so much so that you could see his bones. They ripped his beard, beat him as they made him carry his own cross. They drove nails through his hands and feet. Not for one second did he have a moment's rest, nor did anyone offer him anything. Oh, except for those soldiers when he arrived there at the hill, Golgotha, tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh. Interestingly, he did not take it. It was, a, it was a potion, really, that helped deaden the pain. I'm thinking, guys, this is a little late. You know, should have given it to him before they whipped him. It is instructive that Jesus refused even this minor comfort. As he was taking on all the sin of the world, he willingly took on all the pain that humans can experience. He didn't avoid the pain that humans can experience. And so when Jesus hung on the cross, he was not the beautiful manicured savior that perhaps we've seen in artist renditions. Rather, he was a, a bloody, maimed, disfigured version of a human being. 
illustrative of what sinful humans can do to one another. It's quite possible that the last drink Jesus had was at the Passover meal early on the previous night. So with all the blood loss, the exposure and the heat, doubtless he was suffering from severe dehydration. Have you ever suffered from real dehydration? Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not pleasant. I have, actually. Um, tongue sticks to the roof of the mouth. You can't get any saliva going. Can hardly move. Sometimes the jaws become stiff. You get a headache and so on and so on. We have known, friends, for 2,000 years that he was and is divine, the only begotten Son of God. We know the outcome of this terrible drama of the cross. In three days, he will rise from death. We know that. But let us not forget that Jesus was human. He suffered as God and as human, paying the price of sin that was too great for humans to pay. In order to redeem flesh, he became flesh. He entered into the suffering and pain and all the agony that humans can live in. He entered into that. I thirst. It's the experience that we all know. He knows what it means to be one of us. The Nicene Creed says that he was incarnate of the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary and became truly human. This simply reflects the truth that we know from the book of Hebrews. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. I suppose one of the great, if not the ultimate irony of the Bible, is that the one who offers living water now cries out, I thirst. Thirsting as any man or woman has ever thirsted, reminding us just how down to earth Christianity really is. You may recall his talk with the Samaritan woman at the well. The story is found in John chapter 4. I think we read it earlier. He asked her to give him a drink, not just because he wants to teach her a spiritual lesson. He asked her for a drink because he's walking in Samaria, a dry and hot country, walking all day. He's thirsty. And yet he also sees it as an occasion to say to her, everyone who drinks of this water, meaning from the well, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. Another great irony is that, is that he who turned water into wine, you recall his first miracle performed at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Uh, the host ran out of wine for all his guests and Jesus took some jars of water and turned them into the finest wine available. What an irony, the one who turns water into wine, on his arrival at the Golgotha, the, the skull hill to be crucified, he was offered wine mixed with a narcotic to deaden pain. He refused it and suffered all the pain that anyone could ever suffer. And later, in response to his cry of thirst, he's given cheap wine, uh, cheap vinegar wine. You know the type that you use for cooking at home? They gave, it, it gives only a momentary relief to the lips and the tongue. By the way, speaking of hyperlinks as I did earlier, did you notice that the soldiers lifted up a sponge to him? I guess I'm, I'm using this one. Uh, <laughs> I guess I can't wander, folks. <laughs> the soldiers lifted up to him a sponge with this vinegar wine on it. Remember the, the, the stalk or the stick that they used? It says from the hyssop plant. You might recall that from the book of Exodus. 
when God gave instructions to the Israelites about fleeing from Egypt, they were to sacrifice a lamb, dip a stalk of hyssop in the blood, and mark the posts and lintels of their homes. Interesting. But we know that vinegar wine doesn't quench thirst, only water can. And only in the last moments of his life does he cry these words of personal pain, I thirst. The Bible tells us that when Jesus hung on the cross, he knew that he had borne the sins of the human race and suffered all the painful consequences. He knew that he had done everything he could for you and for me. And he knew that his work had been completed. And having done what God had sent him to do, having cared for the needs of others, only then does he make a comment about his own intense suffering. He who is the water of life is now dying of thirst. When they put the crown on his head, he didn't say, oh, my head. Uh. When they ripped the beard from his face, he didn't say, hey, guys, that hurts. That's my face. And when they scourged him, he didn't say, oh, my aching back. As the old spiritual says, through it all, he never said a mumbling word until this very last moment. Still, there is a tough question that lingers at this scene of Jesus on the cross. And maybe it's a question that lingers in the back of your mind. Certainly, it's a question often unspoken among your neighbors. Did it really matter what Jesus said and did? Was Jesus, dare I say, actually a failure? Well, think about it. You could make a good case for that. Look at his life. He was born into an unimportant family. Anybody else here born into an unimportant family? In an unimportant village. Anybody else born in an unimportant place? He was laughed at at times. And when he talked and spoke, the powers to be wanted nothing to do with him. He had a few devoted followers, but let us not forget there were many who opposed him, misunderstood him, or simply ignored him. Perhaps even as today, many ignore him or take him for granted. In the end... He was crucified just like an ordinary criminal in unspeakable suffering. When he died, he appeared to be another forgotten footnote in history. Yes, I think you could make the case that our Lord was a failure. And there are many who still do make that case. But don't you know that you can do everything you know to be right and still end up suffering tremendously. Isn't it true that you can walk the path of righteousness and integrity and still end up having nothing to show for it? You can pray and pray and pray and it seems like your prayers go unanswered. You can go to work live by the rules, you can do a good job, and still the day comes when you can lose it without warning. You may save your money for the dream of your life and suddenly have your money taken away by circumstances beyond your control. Just yesterday I was listening to the radio to a program on Saturday afternoon. It's called Bill Handel on the Law. Marginal legal advice that tells you you have no case. Um, it's a lawyer in Los Angeles. He had a woman call in saying that she had sold her grocery business that she, she and her son had run for many, many years. 
Um, and presumably this was going to be her retirement. She'd sold it to another party. The other party didn't make payments and then declared bankruptcy. And so the sad advice she got was, well, there's nothing more you can do. She said, you mean I've lost all that money? Yes, it's gone. I mean, they declared bag bankruptcy. You have no recourse. You may work and work and work to make a marriage hold together, and in the end, it may fall apart, though you've done everything humanly possible to hold it together. You may have dear friends whom you love who will then turn against you in the moment of crisis, even though you know you have walked with integrity and truth. There's no guarantee, is there? You could do everything right and it could turn out wrong. We don't like to hear this, but really there are no guarantees in life. Indeed, we do all that we can to avoid suffering and tragedy and to, to assuage its pain. Yet suffering and tragedy nevertheless come unbidden. Anybody here volunteer for suffering and tragedy? Anybody ask for suffering and tragedy to come their way? I don't think so. Life can oft, if you don't mind me stretching a metaphor, life can oft times seem like a desert with little shade or sustenance when we need it most. And our desert that we experience in those terrible times in our lives, our desert is the opposite of the paradise Jesus offered the penitent thief. Out here, life is hard, and we long for someone to help us. And yet, and yet we seem so prone to wander from the very one who can bring us relief. We still think like the Samaritan woman at the well says, Oh, show me this water so I don't have to come back to the well and ever draw water again. She's still thinking of her physical needs. Suffering in hard times, friends, are no sign that you're out of the will of God, nor necessarily a sign that you're doing something wrong. Oh, sure, you may be doing something wrong, or maybe you did something wrong in the past, and that's why you're suffering now. That does happen. I mean, who, who else besides me has made bad choices in life and suffered the consequences? There are real-time and delayed-time consequences for our mistakes and our sins. The power of sin, of course, is the false promise that it will bring more happiness than holiness will bring. And from time to time, more or less, we all succumb to that lie. But many of the difficulties that we face may not come because we have done something wrong. Suffering can just as well come because we've done something right. Case in point, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at him. He's a bloody mess on the cross. Look at him begging for water. But what has he done wrong? What sin has he committed? What terrible crime has he committed? He's done nothing but obey the Father's will perfectly. And what he got for it was the cross. So, are you so sure that you can avoid suffering and tragedy by your good deeds? I mean, really, there's some who buy into that philosophy that says if you do everything right, all will come up roses. It didn't happen that way for Jesus. Why do you think it will happen that way for you? Now, now this is not an argument to do everything wrong or not care about doing right. It's just saying that it doesn't guarantee that it'll all come up roses. You know, you heard that old saying, if everything is coming your way, you're probably in the wrong lane. <laughs> Do you understand what this means? What I'm trying to say is that your loneliness, your brokenness, your disappointment and frustration does not necessarily mean you're outside the will of God. Your poverty doesn't necessarily mean you're outside the will of God. 
Your pain does not necessarily mean you're outside the will of God. The broken relationships that you've experienced or maybe even caused do not necessarily mean you are outside the will of God. Your sickness does not necessarily mean you are outside the will of God. We all suffer the consequences of sin, be it our own, that of others near or far, or just the general brokenness of all creation. Just look. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself did not sin. He lived the will of God, and yet he ended up on the cross. Still, still, he sought after his heavenly Father. And there's the model for us. You might recall his promise. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So I ask again, was he a failure? I don't think so. I think he was the greatest success the world has ever seen. Jesus wasn't broken, you see. He was doing what he knew he was supposed to do. He was and still is fixing the relationship that humanity broke with God. Life and all of its tragedies and suffering did not break him. He was fixing the relationship that humanity broke with God. And likewise, through him, we need not be broken by all the pain and difficulty of life. Nobody ever accomplished more than Jesus Christ did. Is he not illustrating that true success comes through suffering and hardship and loss? And here's another truth we learned from him. Sacrifice precedes success. If you go back into the Gospel of John, there's another very interesting scene where Jesus stands before the crowd. It says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within him. Friends, the question is not, do you thirst? The question is, how long will you thirst? Our physical thirst is easily satisfied with a glass of water. Yet everyone who drinks of that water will be thirsty again. He said, the water that I will give will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He was speaking of the spiritual water, the water of life. And this is what is so difficult for us to grasp that all of our physical life is really undergirded by spirit. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. This is really a come to Jesus moment just now. It's an encouragement, a challenge to us to stop drinking the Kool-Aid that the world offers. Pleasure, instant gratification, comfort, false promises of fame, fortune, and success without sacrifice. That's what we all want, really, right? Success without sacrifice. Come to the living water of Jesus where your thirst for meaning and significance and eternity will be satisfied. That's what all the Kool-Aids of the culture are saying. They're saying your thirst for meaning and significance will be satisfied. And they're wrong. Come to Jesus, the living water. Living with an eye on heaven, your sufferings and tragedies and all that life can throw at you will become meaningful. With the one who bore all the sin and suffering of humanity at your side, 
your troubles will become bearable. Are you suffering in some manner right now? Many of us carry suffering with a stoic face. Do you live in darkness? Maybe in some area of your life. Is the way unclear? Do you feel pain of those turning against you? Don't lose heart. We know he triumphed. And we know that we will share his glory. The final chapter of our grand story is found in the last book of the Bible. Let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Amen. Let thy goodness like a fair